You know, it's funny. At the end of the last video, I made an offhand remark about my unfortunate habit of not finishing projects when the electronics started. I considered the joke to be unlucky, and I deleted it immediately. Unfortunately, Adobe had the information. They sent it to whoever runs the physics engine for this world, and I blew some stuff up. We can take some solace in the fact that I know exactly what was wrong, I fixed the problem, I ordered new PCBs, and I think I should be on track pretty quickly. But here we are with a video with no electronics in it. At the very least, with all the mechanical parts done, we can put things together, which is still the fun part. Before I can install my system, I've got some maintenance to do. The cross slide nut's actually broken, which makes it quite backlashy, but it's also loose, which makes it extremely backlashy, so I'd like to tighten it up at least. A little bit of backlash on a manual machine isn't the end of the world, and my new system should account for it, but it's about 50 thousandths of an inch right now, which is pretty excessive. It's about half a handle rotation. I'm not going to make a new nut for the machine today, but I'm at least going to tighten it up a little bit. I really admire the fit and finish on this machine, and someday I'll go through it in a lot more detail, but for now we can just enjoy how well everything fits together. An example of the excellent engineering is that the cross slide nut actually enters from the side through the dovetail, and rather than having a large slit go all the way down the dovetail, they match ground a tiny insert that goes in the side and provides a lot of rigidity, so half the dovetail isn't kind of just hanging off. This machine poses some interesting safety challenges from a disassembly standpoint. For example, while all the edges are deburred, they can still be pretty sharp. Many surfaces have very little clearance between them, and the risk of pinches becoming shears is quite high. Another example is that while the compound slide moves very freely near the middle due to wear, it's still tight at the ends of travel. It would be tempting to try to force the slide off, but then you might end up with some unwanted dental work. You can see that I took my time and loosened the jib quite a bit before I tried to take the compound slide off. You can also see how the nut actually enters from the side of the dovetail, like I was saying before. Once I wipe off a little bit of the dirt and oil, we can have a closer look at the broken nut. The nut used to be a pedal type nut, or at least that's what I'm calling it. It's a pretty good option for precision and wear compensation. Unfortunately, they don't tend to be that strong. Obviously. The nut's comprised of two main sections. There's the body, and then there's pedals, normally four of them coming off. The pedals are on a smaller diameter than the body and are slit into sections, usually four. There are garter springs that force the pedals to constrict radially onto the screw, but the pedals remain stiff along the axis of the screw. When there's clearance at the roots, the thread forms pushing together eliminates the clearance between the faces. As the screw wears, the garter springs continue to push in and continue to compensate. The pedals have broken off the nut on my lathe, which means no backlash prevention for me. Anyway. The reason we're doing this maintenance is just to clean out the slot that the nut interfaces with, lock tight the screws, and retighten them. I'm also going to add some shim stock when everything is aligned. You can see that because the nut interfaces with the slot, if there's any clearance between the slot and the nut, the nut will simply rotate until it takes up the clearance before it starts feeding the axis. This results in increased backlash. I went through pains to ensure this machine was fully oiled, but I have to remove any oil before I can apply Loctite, so I'm using lots of isopropyl alcohol. Solvents can still leave a thin film of oil, so lots of solvent has to be used to make sure all the oil is gone. Applying heat is also a very effective way of degreasing and doesn't leave a film, but it just didn't feel right here. The Loctite I'm using here is 242, the blue stuff, which should keep the screws from loosening. Despite this, the shim stock will be doing most of the work keeping the nut aligned. Once the screw is screwed in and the Loctite enters an anaerobic environment, I have to work fast, which is why I'm fast forwarding. These screws obviously had to be low profile, so they used button head screws, which I hate because they strip out so easily. Once the screws are in, I apply a lot of oil and then wipe it off just to make sure that the exposed surfaces don't rust. The compound slide must have found this experience very confusing. Now we can finally start the main storyline, assembling the compound feeder. I didn't cover modifying the pulley, but it was fairly straightforward. I simply bored some relief in the back for the screw preload nut, tapped some holes in the front, and pulled off the guide flanges. The handle slips over the hub of the pulley and is screwed into the front face. The bore of the hand wheel doesn't constrain the assembly, but it does locate the hand wheel while the screws are being tightened. You can also see that I drilled but didn't tap a second hole in the hand wheel for an additional handle if I want one later. A second smaller handle can help with precise positioning on a small hand wheel, but it obviously comes down to user preference. A lead screw that's bent right at the handle is a common form of damage on older machines, and it's usually caused by the machine being bumped, tipped over, or dropped. The handles tend to stick out more than other parts of the machine, so if something's going to hit it, it's probably going to hit the handles. We can now switch over to assembling the actual drive assembly. 
Note that while I am assembling this for the first time on camera, it will be taken apart again so Loctite can be applied to the fasteners, the dowels can be installed, and I can run the wires to the fabled electronic components. The first thing I'm doing is installing the track rollers in the part that shall not be named and verifying that they rotate freely. Next I can install the fixed half of the dovetail with two M4 screws. I'm tightening the screws firmly for now, but when the compound feeder is aligned I will ream the dowel holes and the dowel pins will take up the majority of the applied forces. This joint will be pulled in shear because of the belt tension, so the dowel pins are going to be really helpful to prevent the joint from slipping. Next I'll be installing the motor, which is the cause for some of the delays I've encountered. It's a closed loop stepper motor called a Mechaduino, which was a Kickstarter a while back. I had to redesign the electronics a little to avoid using this motor due to a combination of low availability and catastrophic damage caused by incompetence. We'll go into more detail a little bit later. I screwed the motor on next. NEMA 17 motors take M3 screws but permit only a limited threading depth. I don't know what it is, but I never seem to take the two minutes required to make sure I have the right length of fastener in stock. I lucked out this time, but I'd normally adjust the counterboard depth to accommodate what I have on hand. The rear cover just protects the circuitry on the back of the motor, and also gives me a place to mount a DB9 connector. I printed it on my Elegoo Mars 2 SLA printer, and sheepishly painted it black. I'll cover SLA briefly in this video and hopefully go over my process a little deeper in a different video. Everyone seems to have their own secret recipe with SLA part cleaning. Installing the belt is a bit tricky. Because there's no built-in tension mechanism, I have to position it on the large pulley, hook it onto the small pulley, push it between the idlers, and pivot the motor assembly into place. Suffice it to say, this did not all happen on camera. I'm also pleased to say that I'm revisiting the way I light my videos, so hopefully I can tame the glare and white balance issues a little bit. Rotating the hand wheel with the motor disabled is easy and actually feels pretty good. The faint detent clicks fall every half hour or so and it feels very intentional. As I'd mentioned in a previous video, I don't plan to mechanically disengage the motor. I'll simply disable the motor and allow the driver to shunt the generated voltage back to the rails. If this becomes an issue, I may implement a switching system that physically disconnects the two phases when the motor is not enabled, but for now it doesn't seem to be a problem. A technology I've used a lot for this project is SLA printing. I have an Elegoo Mars 2 and an Elegoo Mercury wash and cure station. The price of these machines has really come down. The earlier ones used complicated moving laser based systems, but now most just use a modified LCD screen. My experience has been pretty positive. I've been able to print detailed precise parts, but I have found it can be a bit of a struggle to keep things flat and square. The part is actually projected onto a transparent film in the bottom of the resin, and that's where the resin cures, but the part has to be peeled off the film after every layer. The peeling requires a fair amount of force, and this seems to distort large flat surfaces. Nevertheless, the SLA parts are strong enough and precise enough to be great for things like covers and enclosures. I used red resin because I used it once and it worked for me, and now I'm a lifetime fan. Brand loyalty is weird. SLA has also been great for prototyping mechanical parts, but it is a little more expensive than FDM, so for larger parts I still use FDM. Now that we know where the red printed parts came from, we can plug the system in and try it out. I'm recording this for forensic reasons in case anything dies. Hey, there it is. Well, it's not death death, but something's up. The sentiment I just said into my tinny camera microphone was accurate. I chose the Mechaduino because I could communicate to it using UART. Well, it turns out I'd soldered and desoldered things to it a few too many times. My theory is that I just cooked something while soldering. It's a fairly dense multi-layer board, so you need a fair amount of heat to solder anything to it. I'd reconfigure the connectors a few times, I add DC power to it, change the connectors again, and evidently I just rolled the dice too many times. I was very impressed with the Mechaduino while it was alive, and I would highly recommend it if you can find one. I put the link to the website in the description, but it looks like they're out of stock, and I'm not sure where the project stands now. With no viable replacement readily available, I was forced to revisit my original reason for using a Mechaduino. 
Using a standard stepper motor driver would require the microcontroller to tell the driver every single time it wants to advance by one step. Maintaining a constant stream of steps obviously requires a fair amount of attention from the microcontroller, which reduces the amount of resources it can allocate to other tasks. You can think of it like the microcontroller has a to-do list, and, like an insolent teenager, insists on only moving through it at a certain speed. If most of those tasks are stepping the motor forward, it can't get the other tasks done as frequently. By contrast, a UART-compatible motor just needs an instruction, and it will take care of moving the motor by itself. This frees up a lot of computing resources for things like calculating the RPM to a higher precision, updating the display more frequently, and allowing a little bit of space to add some functionality later. This was necessary when I was using the Arduino Mega. The Arduino Mega has a clock speed of 16 MHz, which means you can do about 16 million things a second. Some things are comprised of other things, so functionally it's much lower than that. But, leveraging my poor programming skills, I quickly hit the performance limits. After it became clear that I wouldn't be able to find another readily available UART motor in time for this project, I switched the system over to a Teensy. A Teensy is a board made by PJRC, which is about the size of an Arduino Nano, but it's based on an M7 processor that runs at 600 MHz. This means it can do about 600 million things per second. The Teensy doesn't need a UART motor because it can run through its to-do list 38 times faster than the Arduino Mega. This means I can use a commonly available off-the-shelf stepper motor and driver, and make the project a little bit easier to replicate. Having to change how the system works this late was quite a setback, but it's also a good opportunity. At its simplest, this system reads an RPM from any rotating shaft with a slotted disc on it, and precisely drives a stepper motor at some proportional speed. There are a lot of things this would be useful for, such as a power quill feed, maybe a hobbing attachment for a rotary table, a geometric turning attachment, and all kinds of other things that I haven't thought of yet. I think I've got two more videos left to make for this project. One will be for electronics and one will be for how I program this system. Maybe it'll just be one video. These topics can be a little dry, but I'm going to try my best to make them entertaining and convey the information in a meaningful way. I promise there's not going to be a lot of scrolling through my code or anything like that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to show a working system in this video, but I'm very optimistic about this project. I'll be putting everything one would need to make this on my Patreon, but I'm waiting until I have a working and debug system. I don't want to put something up that isn't going to work for most people, at least. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and hopefully the next video will be a motor-turning extravaganza. Cheers!